And we're saving the steel, and the mills are now opening up because of what I did. And not all of my friends on Wall Street love it, but we love it because we know what it does. Many plants have just announced over the last few days that they're expanding, opening. Steel is back. It's going to be back, too. Steel is back, and aluminum is back. It's going to be back. And on November 8th, Pennsylvania is the state that gave us the 45th President of the United States. And I think we're doing a good job for you. I hope so. We're working hard. It's not easy. That Washington, D.C., I got a lot of evil there, but we're getting it out step by step. A lot of evil. A lot of bad people. A lot of bad people. A lot of fake media. Look at them. A lot of fake media. Fake, fake media. You know, it's funny. I don't know if you saw it, but we've had a problem for years with North Korea. In fact, President Obama said it was the biggest problem we had. And South Korea went there. We put very, very strong sanctions and lots of other things we've been doing right from the first day I was in office. And South Korea came to my office after having gone to North Korea and seeing Kim Jong-un. And no, it's very positive, no. After the meeting, you may do that, but now we have to be very nice because let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So the South Korean top people, top representatives, they walked out to the White House to a throng of these characters. <laughs> big, big group. And everybody wanted to find out what happened. Now, they had just left North Korea. And look, North Korea is tough. They're testing nuclear weapons. They're doing a lot of things, a lot of, this should have been handled, by the way, over the last 30 years, not now. That's when it should have been handled. They shouldn't have handled it. This should have been handled, and everybody will say it, too. But that's okay, because that's what we do. We handle things. And these guys came out, and they said that your president has done a great job, I might say. but. Well, I'll tell you, we did a great job in the Olympics. President Moon of South Korea said without Donald Trump, the Olympics would have been a total failure. It's true. It's true. You know? Might as well say it. Nobody else is going to say it, right? Might as well say it. Now, a little hard to sell tickets when you think you're going to be nuked. But when North Korea called and they said, we'd like to be in the Olympics, Everybody said, let's buy tickets, let's go. I would have gone. And it became a very, very successful Olympics. Honestly, South Korea did a great job, and it was great to see North Korea going and participating. And there was a nice unity. It was really a nice thing. Really nice. Thing. But when the South Korean representatives who just left North Korea came outside, big throng of press, they announced that North Korea, Kim Jong-un, would like to meet with President Trump. Now, this, is a, this doesn't happen. You know, they're saying, oh, well, Obama could have done that. Trust me, he couldn't have done that. He wouldn't have done that. He would not have done it. And by the way, neither would Bush and neither would Clinton. And they had their shot, and all they did was nothing. They, well, Clinton gave away billions and billions of dollars. And as soon as they made the deal, the following day, they started working on making more nukes, okay? So that was a, that's not the great deal. You ever see the story where I'm, it's 1999, I'm on Meet the Press, a show now headed by Sleepy Eyes Chuck Todd. He's a sleeping son of a bitch, I'll tell you. And they showed it this morning, 1999, and I'm talking about North Korea. You got to take them out now. 
And then they have Clinton saying, we are pleased to announce that we have made a deal with North Korea. Well, you know how that deal turned out, right? We gave billions and billions of dollars and lots of other things. And we got nothing. But they show me, young, handsome. I said, why couldn't I look like that today? I should have run back then, right? Huh? I should have run back then. I would have done this earlier. So, but they had me literally saying, I don't know if anybody saw it, they played a lot, but literally saying, to a very good guy, actually, but saying that we got to do something about North Korea. That was when it wasn't in vogue. And then they have Clinton giving everything away, and then they show, and here we are today with a man who's nuked up all over the place. But we've been very strong and very vigilant, and now lots of good things I think are going to happen, but we'll see. But the funny thing, so they announced that he's not going to send missiles up anymore until through the meetings. Well, think of that. You know, we were losing, we were like getting a lot of missiles sent. I wouldn't say Japan was thrilled. Missiles flying over Japan. <laughs> They're very happy with what I'm doing. And who else could do it? I mean, honestly, when you think. They're not going to send missiles up. Think of it. They're not sending missiles up. And I believe that. I believe that. I really do. I think they want to do something. I think they want to make peace. I think it's time. And I think we've shown great strength. I think that's also important. Right? And, and I must tell you, President Xi of China has really helped us a lot. They've really helped us. And because 93% of the goods come in through China, going into Korea, North Korea. 93%. So that's pretty powerful. And they've been very good. They could have done more, but that's okay. I say to them, you've been great. You could do more. But they've done a lot. They've done more. China has done more for us than they have ever done for any other president or ever done for this country. And I respect that. I respect that. Because you need that. Stopping the flow of goods. Very important. And we put sanctions on. So they come out, White House, many of these same characters that I see. I see those faces. I see those faces. And for the first two hours, it was unbelievable. This is amazing. This is incredible. I can't believe this is happening. You know, because we go from, like, look, a lot of people thought we were going to war. And all of a sudden, they come in. They say, we're going to have a meeting. And there's no more missiles going off. And they want to denuclearize. Nobody heard that. Nobody thought. But they said they want to. They are thinking about that. Who knows what's going to happen? Hey, who knows? If it happens, if it doesn't happen, I may leave fast, or we may sit down and make the greatest deal for the world and for all of these countries, including, frankly, North Korea. And that's what I hope happens. But the press, for two hours, is going, this is fantastic. This is amazing. A certain anchor on CNN, fake as hell, CNN. <laughs> the worst. Oh. So fake. Fake news. And their ratings are lousy, by the way. And compared to Fox, their ratings... <laughs> At a certain... Anchor, female, said, this is really something. He would go down as a truly great president if this happened. Okay, but all of them are saying, this is amazing, this is incredible. Did you hear what they just said? They just said, denuke. They just said all of these things. They just said, no more missiles. They said they want to meet with President Trump. It would, they couldn't believe it. The worst of them, CNN, MSNBC, which is, which is worse. Then I, I think I have a new MSNBC, third rate, and NBC, which is horrible. Their newscast, by the way, is not doing well on NBC Network. They're heading down the tubes. But, but listen to this. 
I did The Apprentice on NBC for 14 seasons. I made a lot of money for them. We had a big, successful show. Arnold Schwarzenegger failed when he did The Apprentice, and he's a movie star. Martha Stewart failed when she did The Apprentice, and I just kept chugging along. Every year it was a big hit. I mean, I did The Apprentice, made them a lot of money, gave them good ratings when they were absolutely dying, and they do nothing but kill me. NBC is perhaps worse than CNN, I have to tell you. And MSNBC is horrible. So here they are. They're outside. These wonderful representatives, very high level from South Korea, are saying all of these things, denuke, and all of the things that they can't believe because it's like five years ahead of schedule. Before this, they were saying, well, that will never happen, and this will never happen, and you'll never get them to stop, you know, with the missiles. They're saying all of this. Now they say they want to stop the missiles, they want to denuclearize, they want to do all of these things, and all of these people are like, they can't believe it. It's unbelievable. I said to my wife, I said, you know, it's amazing. They're really nice tonight. It's really amazing. They're all saying, this is an incredible achievement. This is, okay. Then I get up in the morning, some time goes by. <laughs> right? Same people, they're saying, not that big a deal. Anybody could have done it. Obama could have done it. Obama had a chance. No, no. They're saying, Obama, Obama, Obama. Obama was driving you down. You take a look at those numbers before we took over. They were heading down. So, so just let me say, so I wake up, so it's so nice, and I'm looking forward to watching in the morning. And I go, I mean, literally, they're saying, well, Clinton could have met. Clinton gave away the house. I got nothing. And Bush, 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 another great Republican. He got us into the Middle East. That was a great, we spent $7 trillion in the Middle East over a 17-year period. $7 trillion as of three months ago. Okay? We, you know what they did? That was like taking a big stone and throwing it into a hornet's nest. But we're bringing it back. ISIS, we have 98% of the caliphate of the land back. 98. So I woke up and I saw all these reports that, uh, you know, anybody could have done it. Oh, yeah, sure. Anybody could have gotten... President Xi, President for Life. That was another one. So he's President for Life. It happened two days ago. And I was joking. I was at a, uh, a roast, actually. But I was joking, and I said, huh, President for Life, that sounds good. Maybe we're going to have to try it. Maybe we're going to. President for Life. But I'm joking. But I'm joking. And they knew I was, everybody in the room was laughing, everybody's having a great time. I'm joking about being president for life. A couple of them went back. Donald Trump, with his dictatorial attitude, now wants to be president for life. You know, straight. Fake news. Fake. Fake. Horrible. But you know what's going to happen? I, did you see the other day, 96% of what they do, all I do is good stuff. The economy is the best it's ever been. Your coal, by the way, folks, some of you are in the coal world. Your coal is coming back big, 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 big. Your steel is coming back. Your steel is coming back. Those plants are going to be opening. And what we've done with the 25% tariffs for those guys that come in and dump their steel all over the place. And by the way, it's not good steel. You guys know what I mean. It's crap. But your steel is coming back. It's all coming back. And six months prior to the election in 2020, every one of those guys, we really endorse Donald Trump. We think he has to win. You know why? Because if I don't win the election, their ratings are going to go so far down, they're going to be out of business, every one of them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine covering Bernie or Pocahontas? Pocahontas. How about that? Pocahontas. Can you imagine these guys? Some of them are actually smiling, but some of them just can't stand it, honestly. 
Some of them, they can't take it. Can you imagine having to cover Elizabeth Warren for four years? You know, I was watching during the campaign, and Hillary was sitting right there, and Pocahontas was up, and she was so angry. Look, we love each other, the women, the men. We love each other. Everybody loves her. She was so angry. I said, you know, I think she's losing the entire male audience and many of the women. She was going at it, and Hillary's sitting there saying, oh, my God, what did I do here? This is... <laughs> but can you imagine if they had to cover some of these people that are running? I think any of them, to be honest with you. I think any of them. Oh, I'd love Oprah to win. I'd love to beat Oprah. I know her weakness. No, no, I know her weakness. I, I know her. You know, I know her very well. I was on her last show, or one of the last, I guess, the last week. She had Donald Trump and Donald Trump's family. My, 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 we've come down a long way, haven't we? I'm now president and probably, you know. But, but think of it. I know her weakness. Wouldn't we love to run against Oprah? I would love it. I would love it. That would be a painful experience for her. So we've created three million. Thank you, darling. Oh, they're positive. I thought they were negative. They're positive. That's always the problem. We have a room that's packed. If we have one person, and that's actually a fan. By the way, that's a fan over there. But if we have one person that speaks, it's like a big deal the next day. So we've created 3 million jobs since Election Day. Nobody thought that was possible. We've passed the largest tax cuts and reform in American history. We've created more than 300,000 new jobs alone last month. And you saw the numbers yesterday. Yesterday's numbers, job reports, was among the best numbers ever produced in the history of our country, in the history of our country. In fact, my guys, in fact, my guys came into my office and they gave me the number, because if you add the previous month, which was adjusted upward by 52,000 jobs, they were low last month. It adjusted upward. So we're like over 360,000 jobs. And I said, let me ask you, is that a mistake? I don't think I've ever seen, you know, if you get 160, it's good. We were at 360. So I looked at my guys, I said, is that a typographical error? What is that? But you saw it, it was one of the best reports. And you know the amazing thing? Wages went up a little bit. You haven't had wages in 19 years. Wages are starting to go up. Think of it, wages. I mean, how good is that? Wages starting to go up. African-American unemployment has reached the lowest level in history. The lowest. You know, African-American, and I'm very proud of that, African-American unemployment two months ago reached the lowest level in history. And then last month, it went up a little bit, right? And I made the mistake, because I didn't know it went up. And it wasn't quite as good, but it wasn't historic. So. I was in a different month, and I said, African unemployment is the lowest level in history. They killed me, because it was the previous month. But here's the good news. The new month brought it down to the lowest level, so now it's the lowest level. <laughs> Hispanic unemployment is the lowest level. Think of that. Hispanic unemployment is the lowest level in history. <laughs> women, women, we love you. We love you. Hey, didn't we surprise them with women during the election? Remember? Women won't like Donald Trump. I said, have I really had that kind of a problem? I don't think so. But women won't like Donald Trump. It will be a rough night for Donald Trump. Because the women won't come out. We got 52%, right? 52, right? 
hand, I'm running against a woman. You know, that's not that easy. 155 million people are now employed. That is, came out this morning, that is the highest level of employment in the history of our country. 155 million, think of that. While the Obama administration, in its final year, was losing 1,000 manufacturing jobs a month, we've created almost 300,000 new manufacturing jobs. Think of that. Think of that. The task for all of us, for everyone here tonight, is to make sure that this great American comeback continues full speed ahead. We are doing things that are amazing. You know, make America great again, right? Make America great again, right? So you know what the new slogan is going to be? I, I, I won't tell you. We've got to keep it secret, except did you ever see so much press? Wow. You know what the new slogan will be? Because I can't use it in three years from now. I can't say. Very good. I can't use it. I can't go like in four years and say, here's my slogan, which is now two and a half years we'll have to start thinking, right? It's getting close. We can't say, make America great again, because I already did that. Right? Right? So, right? So our, not my slogan, our slogan, this is a team. Our new slogan will be, and you know, this is on the assumption it happens, which I'm almost positive. Can never be 100% sure. I never like to go too far in advance, but let's assume it's going like it's going. By the way, if we coasted for two and a half years, we did a hell of a job. You know that. In fact, I was telling some of the guys, let's just coast. Because the stock market is up almost 40% since Election Day. Think of that. Almost 40%. Think of that. And by the way, that's not rich people. That's for everybody. I mean, you have your 401ks, which are up 42%, 38%. I tell it all the time. I, I take pictures back with the policemen. I love the policemen. I love the firemen. They're great. Right? And they're always coming up and saying, sir, thank you very much. My 401k is up 41%. My wife thinks I'm a genius. They think like they're great investors, OK? But they're up way, way up. And that's good. That's really good. That's what we want. That's what we want. That's what we have to have. We're so proud of this country. But our new slogan, when we start running in, can you believe it, two years from now, is going to be, keep America great, exclamation point. Keep America great. But we can only do that if we elect people who are going to back our agenda and fight for our values. And that is why we have to defeat Nancy Pelosi. And Maxine Waters, a very low IQ individual. You ever see her? Do you ever see her? Do you ever see her? We will impeach him. We will impeach the press. But he hasn't done anything wrong. It doesn't matter. We will impeach him. She's a low IQ individual. You can't help her. She really is. We will impeach him. But you have Maxine Waters, and you have plenty of others. And I mean, Nancy Pelosi, you can't have that. And Connor Lamb. Lamb the sham, right? Lamb the sham. He's trying to act like a Republican, so he gets, he won't give me one vote. Look, I don't know him. Looks like a nice guy. I hear he's nice looking. I think I'm better looking than him. I do. I do. I do. And he's slightly younger than me. Slightly. No, I heard that. Then I saw him. He's, he's okay. He's all right. Personally, I like Rick Saccone. I think he's handsome.
And you did a great job on television today. I watched you, Rick. That was a great interview. That was a great interview. I appreciate it, too. But he's really good. Here's the thing. We're dealing with people that want to obstruct. They want to stop us from doing things. We put an infrastructure bill in for $1.7 billion, and I hear they want to stop it. They want to stop DACA. DACA is their issue. But I'm willing to go along. Get it done. We've got to get it done, right? Get it done. And besides that, you know, honestly, we need good, great workers in our country, because I'm bringing a lot of companies into this country. We're not going to have workers for it. We have to bring them in. But DACA, they're here. They're good people. And the Democrats are trying to not do so. I offered a deal that was so good you can't refuse, right? Like the mob pictures. I give you a deal that's so good you can't refuse. <laughs> I made a deal. I, I gave them a deal so good they could not refuse. And I did it because I thought they were going to refuse. And they did. <laughs> and they're getting killed now by the DACA recipients. They're getting killed. But somebody like Lamb, he's never going to vote for us. He's now saying, and I appreciate his nice words about me. This is Trump country, right? So he has to say nice. OK, he's smart. So he's saying nice things. Here's the problem. As soon as he gets in, he's not going to vote for us. He's going to vote the party line. He has to. And if he doesn't, he's never going to a chairman of a committee. He's, you know, it's a whole crazy system. But he's going to vote the party line. He doesn't care about us. But for getting your votes, he's talking about how much he likes tariffs which is my baby, and I took a lot of heat over that. But let me tell you, all these countries now are calling up. We don't want the tariffs. What do we have to do? European Union, they kill us. Sounds good. A lot of us came from the European Union, different countries, right? Sounds nice. They kill us on trade. So we put on tariffs, and the European Union's out there. Well, we're going to put on. I said, you can't go any higher than you are anyway. <laughs> and they have trade barriers. We can't even sell our farming goods in there. They totally restrict us. So then they say, we want those tariffs taken off. I said, good. Open up the barriers and get rid of your tariffs. And if you don't do that, we're going to tax Mercedes-Benz. We're going to tax BMW. You want to have money? You want to have money come into our country? And you know, the cars are really the big item. That's the big money item. So when I said that, all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, let's stop talking with this guy. You know, with the European Union, we're like $100 billion down because we had stupid politicians doing stupid things, right? A hundred, think of $100 billion. By the way, we're really, I've always said $71 billion, but Mexico, we're $130 billion. That's a real number because nobody includes the VAT tax. Nobody even knows what a VAT tax is, but Mexico charges a 16% VAT tax. So nobody ever talks about it. You know, they do it. That deal was bad the day they made it, because they had a tax and we didn't. So they have a 16% VAT tax. Nobody ever talks about it. But I talk about it. So we're either going to renegotiate NAFTA. And I said, we won't put the tariffs on Mexico and Canada. And Canada's brutal. Canada's really tough. They, you know, we have a big deficit with Canada, too. They send in timber. They send in steel. They send in a lot of things. But our farmers in Wisconsin are not treated well when we want to send things to them. Hey, and I don't blame them. Why should I blame them? Because they just outsmarted our politicians for decades. And I don't mean Obama. I mean all of them. Since Bush the first. And that includes, I mean, that includes a lot of territory. Frankly, Ronald Reagan. You remember, I didn't love his, I thought he was great. I loved his style, his attitude. He was a great cheerleader for, our you know, for the country, but not great on the trade. For many, many years, they've been outsmarting. You know, we used to be a nation of tariffs. When other countries would come to the United States, they had to pay for the privilege of taking our product, of taking our jobs. They had to pay. They wanted to come in and sell their product. They had to pay. Today, in China, they sell a car to us. They pay 2.5%. We sell a car in China, which, by the way, is almost impossible to do despite the tax. It's 25%. So why is that 25 and we're 2.5? And, and that's why we have a trade deficit with China, 
of $500 billion a year. It's no good. But we're changing it, and it takes a little while. I'm there a year, a little more than a year. We're changing it. We have to. We have a trade deficit. We have a trade deficit with all countries of the world. Listen to this number. If there's any children in the room, please close your ears. We have a trade deficit of almost $800 billion a year. Now, who makes these deals? So with Mexico, he says Obama. <laughs> Honestly, in all fairness to Obama, it's more than Obama. It's plenty of people, believe me. Plenty of presidents allowed that to happen, and people that work for the president. So we're going to get a lot of things straightened away. NAFTA is under work right now, and I think they're going to be very good. And you saw what I did with the tariffs. They said, we don't want to pay tariffs. I said, let's make a deal on NAFTA. And if you make a decent deal, a fair deal for the American worker, the American people, we will — you'll have no problem with the tariff. I said the same thing to the European Union. I said, look, you're killing us. We're losing $100 billion a year. You're not accepting our product. They're not accepting our farm product. I want to help the farmers. And they don't accept it. And I said, open up your countries. That's countries. They banded together. Why did they band together? To screw the United States on trade. And that's okay. They're allowed, you know. Actually, here it would be called a monopoly. It wouldn't be allowed. But all those countries got together in order to do well on trade with the United States. People don't know that. You know, you hear European Union sounds so, oh, the European Union sounds so innocent. It's not innocent. They're very tough. They're very smart. We lose $100 billion a year. They sell stuff into us. We charge them practically nothing. We sell things into them. Number one, you can't get it through the barriers. They have artificial barriers. That's not a monetary barrier. That's other things. Environmental. They, they come up with things you wouldn't even believe. But we can't get our product in there. So I said, open up your barriers, get rid of your tariffs, and we'll do this. We'll have a nice, fair, open. And if you don't do that, that's okay. And that's where the cars come in. So we have a lot of work to do. But I need people that can help me. And this guy can really help me. This guy can really help me. Rick Saccone. And I've got him, too. And he's got a tough race. And he's got a tough race. I think we won by 22 points. And Rick, you know, look, it's a crazy time out there. It's crazy. But I think the Republicans, you know, you never hear this. So I've been, in fact, I think she's here, Karen Handel. Where's Karen? Was she here? She was here. Where is she? Did I do a good job, huh, in Atlanta? So Karen, is this sort of like around this? Karen was down. She started off with a whole group of people. It's a little different voting. She had running for Congress in Atlanta, the Atlanta area, right? So they had a guy, a young guy, who spent $34 million. That's still the all-time world record, right? Running to be a congressman. They make 150000 bucks a year. He spent $34 million. There's something going on, right? <laughs> so Ka I didn't know you were here. Somebody said you may be here. That's so great, Karen. So Karen was running with many Republicans. It was like 14, 13 Republicans, which is crazy. And Karen was the one I wanted, but that's a lot of Republicans. So Karen ended up with about 14 or 15. This guy ended up, he was 58, 58, which meant he would have won the election. There was no more runoff, right? And we came after him, right? We came after that guy, and we found out a couple of, like, minor things. He didn't live in the district. I heard they said, Sir, he doesn't live in the district, but nobody cares about that. I said, really? Let's try it on the voter. So anyway, you have to get 50, in which case the election's over. If you get less than 50, you have a runoff, and you take the top two. So Karen was fantastic. But she was with so many Republicans, and he was essentially the only Democrat. So I brought him down in a period of four days. I got no credit for this from these guys. Brought him down from 58 to 48. So now. He's in a runoff with Karen. So think of it. He's at 48. She's at 15. By the time Karen and I finish with this guy, 32 million he spent. And she spent slightly less than that, OK? She spent like, like about 29 million less, right? She spent 29 million less. But by the time we finished, 
The winner easily by five points was Karen Handel. So, great. Great. And they love the job she's doing, and I think you're going to have a good victory now, but the people have gotten to know you, and they love you in your area, and hope I don't have to go and make speeches all over the place like last time. But we need, Karen, and we need, we need our Congressman Saccone. We have to have him. We have to have him. Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, the only chance she's got to become Speaker is electing Democrats. And you know what? We don't have a big margin. It's just a very small. If, if you, I mean, they're doing a number in your state. You see what they're doing with the congressional districts. They're doing a number. And hopefully, the United States Supreme Court will take that case because this is horrible what they've done. They had state judges that are Democrats change your voting districts. What kind of stuff is that? What kind of stuff? And it's going to make it very hard for Republicans that are great Republicans that would easily win. And now it's all changed. And it's very unfair. Let's see what happens. It's litigation. It's in court. Let's see what happens. But it's very unfair. The people of Pittsburgh cannot be conned by this guy, Lamb. You just can't do it. Because he's, again, he's never going to vote for us. He can say, I love President Trump. I agree with everything he says. You know what? I don't want to meet him. Because anybody that says that, I might like him. And then Rick is going to be very angry at me, right? <laughs> no, he's going around saying it. But he's not going to do that stuff. He's not going to do it. There's no way he's going for the things that his part. He says, I'm not going to vote for Pelosi. He's not. Now, that could be possible. But most people are. Most people are. But he says he's not going to do that. He's going to do this for steel. He's going to do that. Well, the Democrats are opposed to those things. He's weak on crime. He's weak on the border. He's weak on the Second Amendment. But all of a sudden, he got strong. And by the way, in terms of abortion, take a look at his record. Take a look. It's amazing. He's come back. Oh, well, take a look at his record. Because where his record is, that's where he's going. So Pelosi's party in Congress is full of people who tell their voters one thing during the election and then go to Washington and vote lockstep. You know, the one thing I noticed about them, and I've been there now for 14 months. 14 months. Can you believe But have we done a lot? Yeah. Oh, it's like We have done more than any first-term administration in the history of our country. We have. You take a look at what we've done. Regulation, tax cuts, federal judges, a great, great Supreme Court, Justice Gorsuch. Great. Look what we've done. Look what we've done. And you know what? We passed the biggest tax cut in the history of our country. Didn't get one Democrat vote. Didn't get one. And by the way, how good is that kicking in? Remember? Remember? We passed it. We didn't get one Democrat vote. Think of that. Not one. And now they're all a little, they're getting a little nervous. That's OK. But we didn't get one. And you know what helped? When AT&T and the big companies came, they started paying thousands and thousands of dollars in bonuses to, you know, millions of people. I think it's up to 5 million people now. And that was not in the schedule. But they're paying the money out. And the people are getting the money. And I'll tell you what, we're so proud of that. But we also got rid of the individual mandate from Obamacare, which basically guts out Obamacare. That'll be next. That'll be next. That's where you pay a lot of money for the privilege of not getting health care, OK? How do you like that one? How that one made it through court, I will not. Made it through twice. But you pay a lot of money for the privilege. So we got rid of the individual mandate. Nobody even talks about it. Because the tax bill is so massive, bigger than Reagan, bigger than biggest one ever done. And you know, they, we're calling it tax reform. This is where a non-politician like me is good. Because they had a name. And for 40 years, they couldn't pass anything. And I kept saying, how is it possible not to pass tax cuts? Sir, I don't know. We just can't pass. It's been Reagan was the last one that did a big bill. And we just can't pass. I said, well, 
what's the problem? Well, sir, the tax reform is not easy. I said, wait a minute. Do you call it tax reform? Or do you call it tax cuts? And he said, right? And he said, no, sir, we call it tax reform because we're doing a lot of reforming. I said, look, people don't know what reform means, neither do I. People want tax cuts. They don't know. They don't know. They want tax cuts. They want tax cuts, and honestly, the word reform, it could mean you're going to triple your taxes. We're going to reform taxes and triple. I said, nobody knows what it means. It could be really bad. So they said, you know, we never thought of it. This is after 40 years. Nobody ever thought of it. So they said, could you come up with a name? And I did. You know what it was called? The tax cut, 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 cut bill. But I must tell you, and on this, I think they were right. The politicians thought that was a little hokey. So we call it the Tax U.S. Tax Cut and Jobs Bill, which is nice, which is nice. And we got it passed. We had unanimous, unanimous in the Republican Party and unanimous for the Democrats. And by the way, you're going to have a great man running as a Republican for the Senate. While we're here, Rick, we should say it, right? Sweet Lou, right? He's going to be great. He's got a chance. He is, he is with you all the way. He loves this state. He loves the people. And we'll be out fighting for him very, very hard. Okay? You know who that is. You know. But he's going to be running, and he's, he's running already. He's running very hard. He's going to be fantastic. So we passed the tax cuts. We didn't have one Democrat vote. Think of that. So I think they're going to have a problem. Now, historically, after a presidential election, the other side, like always, wins. And I've told you, you've heard the story. Because people become complacent. You had a victory. You elected your president. You like you, but you like me? I think so, right? I like you, too. I love you. I love you. So, is there any more fun than at a Trump rally? Yeah. You know, a lot of times I have to do like readings. We'll pass an environmental bill and they want me to go to a. I'm very spoiled. You know, if I go to a small place and they have 2,000 people, it's like, why don't we open a stadium or something? You know, we're spoiled. Other guys, they go out, they get 50 people, they're satisfied. We need crowds like this. In fact, the fire marshal was fantastic. You know, they had a lot of people out. And he's a great guy. I don't want to get him in trouble. But he opened up those doors, and he's got guys say, and he let most of the people that were, for, you know, they were sent away. He got a look at those corners. Now, those cameras are never going to cover those corners. They're never going to cover the corner. They're never going to cover. They never show the crowds. They never like to show the crowd, ever. You know, the only thing is the noise. Because you can't imitate it. It sounds like a Penn State football game. It sounds like an Ohio State football game. Right? You can't. I'll, I'll say to friends, I'll say to friends, did you see my speech last night? Yes. Then the first, I have to say, how good was I? How good? And they say, good. I said, did they show the crowd? No, they didn't. He said, but you know what? I could tell by the noise. That crowd was really big. You can't hide that. You can't hide that. Can't do it. Can't do it. So the Democrats are the party of sanctuary cities. Explain that one, right? They like to protect criminals. They like to protect MS-13. These are the, this is the party of, how about that? How about that? How about ICE? These ICE guys are tough as hell. They go in and they're not playing games, you know? The only thing, I hate to say this, not so politically correct, but the only thing these gang members understand is toughness. I hate to say it. 
They're not interested in genius. They're not interested. They're interested in somebody that's tougher than them. That's what. And we have the toughest people you've ever seen. And they went out to Long Island, and they grabbed them by the neck, and they threw them into the paddy. We're cleaning out. We're doing it. We are building the wall, 100%. 100%. You know, the president of Mexico, who I think is a really nice guy, because, you know, it's been build a wall. And I can't get through a speech without somebody, because I was all set to say build a wall, and then these guys start screaming build a wall. Well, we're building it. But the president of Mexico calls, and, you know, I told you, we're in the midst of negotiating NAFTA. So we have a little sticking point. He called up, and respectfully, because he really is a high-quality guy. And he called up, he goes, Mr. President, we would like you to make a statement that Mexico will not pay for the wall. I said, are you crazy? You think I'm going to pay? I'm not making that statement. He said, well, you have to. I said, is it a deal breaker? He said, yes. I said, bye-bye, we're not making a deal. There's no way I'm making it. Now, what I will say, and I, what I told him, is, President, don't worry. It all comes out in the wash. We're going to put it into the NAFTA agreement. Nobody's going to be talking too much about it. It'll be part, because we're going to make a much better NAFTA deal. We have to. When we lose $130 billion with Mexico, I think we can do a little better than that, right? The wall. You know what the wall is? It's this. You don't even notice it. It's like a little asterisk on the bottom. Okay. So he said to me that, and I said, no, I th we can't do that. We actually broke it up. He was going to come to Washington. No way I'm going to say anything like that. But I will say, we will build a wall. We have to build a wall. We have to build a wall. And the Democrats are holding it back. You know, we had a deal, $25 billion, And by the way, if I get $25 billion for the wall, you're going to have a lot of change. You're going to have a lot of change. I've got... I've got all the big builders, the best ones in the world. I know the best builders. You know, we want to use the good builders, not the bad ones. Save a lot of money on the airplanes. We save a lot of money on Air Force One. $1.4 billion, we save. 1.4. Still too expensive. It's crazy. It's crazy. But we saved a lot of money. I got Boeing in, and we had a talk, and we, we saved a lot. Of, we saved $1.4 billion, okay? I mean, that's worth a 10-minute meeting, right? I don't care how big the United States is. But we're going to build a wall, and we have to build a wall for people, for gangs, for drugs. The drugs has never been a problem like we have right now. And by the way, like the world has with drugs. And you know what? We fill up these councils. They all want to be on councils. They call them blue ribbon councils, where we take Melania. Great, great first lady. We take, she's great. She's great. She is great. You think her life is so easy, folks? Not so easy. She is a great first lady. But we put Melania and other people on this blue ribbon committee. Do you think the drug dealers that kill thousands of people during their lifetime, do you think they care who's on a blue ribbon committee? The only way to solve the drug problem is through toughness. When you catch a drug dealer, you gotta, you gotta put them away for a long time. When I was in China, and other places, by the way, I said, Mr. President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 we do not. I said, huh. Big country, 1.4 billion people, right? Not much of a drug problem. I said, what do you attribute that to? Well, uh, the death penalty. <laughs> so, hey, if you're a drug dealer, and you know you're going to get caught, and you know that you're going to kill people, you're killing our kids. They're killing our kids. They're killing our kids. They're killing our families. They're killing our workers. You know, we have a hard time. Of the 100 million people, that special group of people, they're great people, they want to work. We have a hard time 
A lot of them can't qualify to work in these factories. Chrysler's coming back in. You saw that from Mexico to Michigan. You have, we have companies coming back into the United States. You haven't seen that. I used to tell you that was going to happen, but now it's happening. But a problem, a lot of people can't qualify because of drugs. But I said to the president, I said, so you don't have much of a problem? No. And they had a problem. You know, if you go back 200 years ago, and they know all about drugs. It was devastating to China, the opium. Devastating. It destroyed China. And I'm not going to let it destroy us. And there was an article in one of the main papers. Maybe it was the failing New York Times. It's one of them. And I don't even know where they get it. Because honestly, I don't know that the United States, frankly, is ready for it. They should be ready for it. But at a minimum, you have to give long, tough sentences. But if you go to Singapore, I said, Mr. President, what happens uh, with your drugs? No, we don't have a problem, President. I said, really, what? We have a zero tolerance. And he's not playing games. These guys don't play games. You know, we have a different type of people. They don't play games. I said, how are you doing on drugs? No problem. I said, what do you mean, no problem? And that's entertainment, you know, a lot of things are happening. I said, what do you mean, no problem? We have a zero tolerance policy. What does that mean? That means if we catch a drug dealer, death penalty. That's it. And they don't have a problem. Now, remember this. If somebody goes and shoots somebody or kills somebody, they go away for life, and they can even get the death penalty, right? One person. They shoot one person, they get the death penalty. They shoot one person, kill some person, knife one person, the person dies. They get maybe the death penalty or maybe life in prison, no parole, right? Okay? A drug dealer will kill 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people during the course of his or her life. Thousands of people are killed or their lives are destroyed, their families are destroyed. So you can kill thousands of people and go to jail for 30 days. They catch a drug dealer. They don't even put them in jail. Think of it. You kill one person, you get the death penalty in many states. Or you get life imprisonment. You think of it. You kill 5,000 people with drugs because you're smuggling them in and you're making a lot of money and people are dying and they don't even put you in jail. They don't do anything. But you might get 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. You might get a year. But you're not going to get... And then you wonder why we have a problem. That's why we have a problem, folks. And I don't think... I don't think we should play games. Now, I never did polling on that. I don't know if that's popular. I don't know if that's unpopular. Probably you'll have some people that say, oh, that's not nice. But, but these people are killing our kids, and they're killing our families, and we have to do something. We can't just keep setting up blue ribbon committees with your wife and your wife and your husband, and they meet. And they have a meal, and they talk, 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 talk. Two hours later, then they write a report. Says, Yo, I, look, that's what I got in Washington. I got all these blue ribbon committees. Everybody wants to be in. Blue ribbon, and we have the opioid problem. And for that, we have to go after the drug companies. We have to. We have no choice. We have to go after the drug companies. We have no choice. So, so, I think it's a discussion we have to start thinking about. Don't you agree? I don't know if you're ready. I don't know if this country's ready for it. But I think, Rick, I think it's a discussion that we have to start thinking about. So, in Oakland, you have a mayor. And she... And she told people that we're going to be captured in a big raid, that there's going to be a raid. Can't do it. You can't do it, folks. We've got to get smart. My administration believes our city should be safe havens for American people, not for American criminals, okay? Not for American criminals. 
We're going after violent criminals, and we're going after vicious gang members. These are so, these people are so tough. But you know, we had our ICE agents out in Long Island. Can you imagine? I grew up like around in Queens in New York, which is sort of, but I knew Long Island, sort of like on the way, right? And places that I know so well are loaded up with MS-13, where your daughter walks home. And they don't use guns. You know, we talk guns. The NRA happens to be very good people, by the way. They want to do the right thing. But they don't use guns. They don't use guns. They like to use knives and other things because it's much more painful, it's much slower, it's much... These are animals. And we send these guys out, and we liberate those towns. We liberate them. Hillary wouldn't have liberated those towns. We liberate those towns. And the people are cheering. It's like a war. It's like if you got liberated as a country. Can you imagine this is taking place in our country? It's crazy. So we are doing a great, great job. We are loving it. We're making tremendous progress. Today, I'm calling on Congress to stop funding sanctuary cities so we can save American lives. The funding bill should not give precious and massive taxpayer grants to cities aiding and abetting criminals. That's what they do. Look at the stories. Kate and so many. Look at the stories, how horrible they are. I'm also calling on Congress to finally end chain migration and cancel the very dangerous visa lottery. Now, they're probably, again, the Democrats want to obstruct, so we're probably going to have to wait till after the election. We'll get Rick in there, and we'll get some other people in there, and we'll be able to get it passed, because these guys don't want to do anything. They don't want to do anything. You know, they criticize because we have vacancies in certain administrative offices. We have 270 people that we cannot get the Democrats to approve to come in and work in our administration. They're out there. We have the ambassador from Germany, and I take heat. These guys are always saying, well, you don't have an ambassador, because the Democrats won't approve them. They obstruct, they delay, they do everything they can, and that's all they're good at. They have no ideas. They have no ideas. I mean, I look forward, I really do, I look forward to 2020 because I want to see how far left the person is going to be that we're going to run against. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. I really do. I really do. So together with your help, your voice, your vote, we can achieve more than anybody. I mean, again, I, I really believe, and I'm not saying this as braggadocious, because I tell you if we didn't, but the tax bill, when we got the individual mandate. But we also got ANWR. Most people don't know what it is. That's one of the biggest fields in the world. We got it approved. They've been trying to approve it for 40 years. That was a part of the tax bill. That alone would have been a massive thing to approve. We got ANWR in Alaska, one of the biggest fields in the world that will start working. And other things. So as long as we're proud of who we are and what we're fighting for, there is nothing beyond our reach, nothing. We need Republicans put in office. We need Senate, and I think we're going to do pretty well with the Senate. You know, the numbers are looking pretty good. Did you see the numbers from about two months ago? And you see the numbers now, it's like from a different world, because people are seeing what we're doing. They're seeing what we're doing. We stand on the shoulders of patriots who poured out their sweat and blood and tears and we're going to do things that nobody's been able to do. You know, it's very funny. Every time I go out to speak, we have these massive crowds. And you know how many people. Thousands were turned away. We let thousands in. But thousands were turned away. And I read one woman in the Wall Street Journal today. Nice woman. I like her, actually, Peggy Noonan. And she wrote an article about me. And 
you know, I went to the Wharton School of Finance. My student, this is very smart. You know, Ivy League school, great, the best business school, I think. It's one of the hardest schools to, even in my day, I mean, I went to the Wharton School, did great. And then you gotta read how we're like, like, is Trump a good speaker? She's talking about, he uses a language that, you know, you know how easy, remember I used to tell, how easy it is to be presidential? But you'd all be out of here right now, but you'd be so bored. Because I could stand out, right? I could stand out. Yeah. I'm very presidential. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight. Rick Saccone will be a great, great congressman. He will help me very much. He's a fine man. And Yang is a wonderful wife. I just want to tell you on behalf of the United States of America that we appreciate your service. We appreciate your service. And to all of the military out there, we respect you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And then you go, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. That's easy. See, that's easy. That's much easier than doing what I have to do. Because, but this is much more effective. Don't forget, this got us elected. If I came like a stiff, you guys wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm reading Peggy Noonan, and she's a nice woman. I like her. She doesn't like me much, but, and she's writing like I'm some kind of a Neanderthal. And I'm saying, you know, I'm really smart. You know, it's funny, they always talk, they always talk about how they're telling us, they said we couldn't get elected. I say we, because you guys came from areas, some of you had never voted before, but you love the country. You never voted before, but you love the country. A great congressman from Tennessee, they vote early. And the voting had started. And he was at a speech I was making in Pennsylvania, believe it or not. But he was there because one of his friends. And it was Lou, but one of his friends was there. So I didn't know him. And they had early voting in Tennessee. And he said, you know, Mr. President, and at that time I wasn't president, but he called me that because he saw it was happening. He said, in Tennessee, the early voting started. And I've been doing this stuff for 32 years. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. Those people are coming out of the hills. They're coming out of the valleys. They're coming out of everything that you can come out of. It's the most amazing thing. And these are people that love the country, but they never voted because they never saw anybody they wanted to vote for. And now they've got Trump, 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 Pence. They've got all the stuff. So I've never seen anything like it. And then they ask, is he a good speaker? I don't know. Look, I don't know if I'm a good speaker. But you know what? Every time I have a 25,000-seat stadium, we fill it up. So something has to, it has to be right. Maybe it's just pure ideas. I don't know. It's heart. Oh, I love that guy. He said it's heart. We all have heart. But this man, great guy, great congressman, actually, he said, all these years, I've never seen anything like it. He said, and I can only tell you, I love the state of Tennessee, but I can only tell you, if the rest of the country is like Tennessee, you're going to win this damn election, and it's going to be easy. And we got 306 to 223. Remember they said? 270. You can not. Remember the famous 270? He cannot win the election because he cannot get above 270. We needed 270. In fact, they couldn't get me to 270, 69. So we had 269. They said he cannot win he cannot get, remember, to 270. And we didn't. We got to 306. We got to We got to three. But remember Pennsylvania? Remember Pennsylvania? That was really terrible. So 
you know, I, I've never done this before. You know, I, I did, I ran for president. I never did it before. Somebody said, you know, I've been running for the Senate like six times. I said, you ran for president, you won. What happened is Pennsylvania, remember that night? So we were one point away. We were at 99% of the vote was tabulated, right? Remember that? 99. And if I lost 10 points, we would have won. There was no way you could lose because we were winning by thousands and thousands of votes. And one point doesn't have all of those thousands of votes. They wouldn't call Pennsylvania. They refused to call it. Remember? And I wanted to win. I wanted to win with Pennsylvania. It was so befitting because they had spent 10 times more in the state of Pennsylvania than I did. 10 times more. And I'm waiting for Pennsylvania. I'm saying, come on, Pennsylvania, go. One point, and I win. And I have thousands more votes than I need. In other words, if every single person of the remainder voted against me, we win easily. They wouldn't call it. And then what happened? Wisconsin came in. We won with Wisconsin, which hadn't been won in decades. And then we won with Michigan. And then finally, they were devastated. You see, they were crying. One, one. <laughs> crying. She's crying. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. Remember John King with the board? I do this every once at the board. The red board's all red. It's like red. Man, that board was red, meaning Republican. And John King, he can't believe it. He goes, I, I think he just won the state of Florida. Yes, Donald Trump won the state of Florida. He's going, oh. Then they go, you had to run. You know, the Electoral College is much harder than the popular vote. Because popular vote, you go to three or four states. Electoral College, you have to go to like 19. I was all over the place. I went to Maine four times because I needed one vote. They had one vote. That was going to be 269 to 270. The one vote was going to be very important. So I went to Maine like four times. That's a lot. I, because I not, a lot of people said, why are you doing it? First of all, I like the people of Maine, but I needed one. But what happened was an incredible, it was an incredible evening. One of the greatest nights in the history of television in terms of numbers of people watching. And we have done a job. So here's what that's going to happen. Let me give you the bad news. The bad news is they want to take it away from us. They want to take it away. They're doing everything they can to take it away. And that starts with the election coming up in a few months. And we have to win it. We have to get out, and we have to win. Normally, I would not come, except it's Pennsylvania. I say, I love it anyway. I love the people. I mean, I went to school. I went to Wharton. I went to school here. I love Pennsylvania. I mean, look, how can I not love it, right? Somebody else would show up here, and then honestly, Rick, what would it be? 50, 60 people in front, right? First of all, you wouldn't have this. You'd have a little place. But I love the state. But I really feel strongly about Rick Saccone, and I know him. I feel strongly about him. He's an incredible guy. Number one, and I don't know that this is important, but to me it is, he's a very fine human being. He's a good person. He's really a good person. Rick, come up, Rick. He's a really good person. So he's a good person. I don't know if that means that. Does that mean anything? He's a very, he's a very competent person. He's a very hard worker. He knows things that many people don't know. He understands North Korea maybe better than anybody. I spoke to him about North Korea. He was there for a long time. And I spoke to him about North Korea. And I'm telling you, I learned things that all of these great geniuses, all of these great experts on North Korea did not tell me. This is a very extraordinary guy. We need him. We need Republicans. We need the votes. Otherwise, they're going to take away your taxes, your tax cuts. They're going to take away your Second Amendment rights. It's true. 
They're going to take away, you know, in the military, big, big military place. We just got approved $700 billion. We have to rebuild our military. $700 billion. Far more than the other party. They'll take that away, too. Our military was really depleted. But I just want to know, I want you to know, I came tonight because this guy is special. And beyond the vote, it's very important. Remember this. The other opponent, his opponent, is not voting for us. He can say all he wants. There's no way he's voting for us ever, ever. And he could be nice to me, and he is. But there's no way he's ever voting for me. Rick is going to vote for us all the time, all the time. So, so I want to ask Rick to say a few words. And, and again, it's an honor to be with you. Go out on Tuesday and just vote like crazy. You got to get out there. The world is watching. This, I hate to put this pressure on you, Rick. They're all watching. Because I won this district, like, by 22 points. It's a lot. That's why I'm here. Look at all those red hats, Rick. Look, look at all those hats. <laughs> it's a lot of hats. And we just had a poll. We're more popular now than we were on Election Day. This guy should win easily, and he's going to win easily. You got to know him. He's an, ex he's an extraordinary person. Go out and vote on Tuesday for Rick Saccone. Rick? Go ahead. Do we love our president here in Western Pennsylvania? Yeah, oh, we do, we do. Let him hear it, let him hear it through those cameras. They probably turned the volume down. They didn't hear you. Just say a couple words. You already heard me speak earlier. I want to thank President Trump. As I said before, if President Trump's in your corner, how can you lose? He's the best man you could ask, anyone could ask to be in your corner. As any good businessman knows, as any good businessman knows, you work on a deal, you work on a deal, but there comes a time to close the deal. This is the time to close the deal. We got two days left. Are you going to help me on Tuesday? Let's close this deal. So, again, with that, we'll say goodnight. But again, go out, vote for Rick. He'll never, ever disappoint you. He's a winner. He's never going to disappoint you. Just go out, vote with your hearts, vote with your brains. This is an extraordinary man. I'm going to be home watching the returns, and I hope that I have to make a call on Tuesday night where I speak to you and Young, and I say, great job, great race. The whole world, remember that. They're all watching. We want to keep it going. We want to keep the agenda, the Make America Great going. You got to get them in. This is a very important race, very important. Thank you all. God bless you. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you.
glass of wine in her hand. I knew she was going to meet her connection. At her feet were the footloose man. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, well, you might find you get what you need. Just my fun.